Good morning, Bowie City Church. I'm glad that you are here with us, uh, worshiping online with us, either via Facebook or YouTube. I'm Dion Bolding, lead pastor here at Bowie City Church, and I say thank you for coming. Welcome. Uh, what we encourage you to do right now is to share the link. Go ahead and hit the share button. To it'll go to your wall, letting people know that you are on church online and you'd love for them to join in. And what we are partaking in in this series that we're in right now called Faith Over Fear as we look at the life of Moses and we have marched through the plagues and we're coming up to the last plague. We're going to uh, preach about that uh, this morning. But before we do that, we always want to acknowledge uh, that we're going to move into a time of worship. And in doing that, as we say every Sunday since we've been online, even when we're in person, that you would engage in the worship, that you would take this time to actually Sing this song of praise. If you don't know the songs, that's that's okay. But engage in worship. Don't let this just be a time of hearing a song in the background and hearing Joe and Julie Turpin give us a great uh, song as they always do. But a time to actually say, all right, I'm going to take this three to four minutes to engage with God, with the Holy Spirit and spirit and truth through song. So I'm going to pray for us. And as always, we thank the Turpins that they've recorded messages for us or recorded songs for us uh, so we can engage in worship via uh, online. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're just going to move on to a time of worship uh, via the Turpins. So let's pray. God, we thank you once again for the great God you are, how much you love us, Lord. And God, we thank you that you woke us up this morning, that we have to see another day. And God, during this time right now, we want to engage with you through this song, through the time of worship and praise. And God, that the words that we sing will not just be empty words, that there'll be words that are a, a message from our heart, a, a song of love to you, or also a reflection of your love to us, God, how great you are in our lives. So God, let us not be a gonging symbol. Let us not just be singing empty words or let just listening to the words of, of Joe and Julie, Lord, but let us also use these words to worship you, how good you are, how much you've blessed us. Be in the midst of this time, this, this sermon series and the message, Lord, and we give this time to you. We expect for you to move and meet with us here. Bless all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen.
like every week but would you like to ride to church with me oh come on mrs edwards you like my church we have some hot music it may not be what you're bumping at all but it's hot we get down what do you say mrs edwards oh i suppose I've heard it said that 80% of first-time church visitors come because someone personally invited them. All people need to feel loved and wanted, and for some people, it just takes having someone offer to give them a ride to church. We have something great going on at this church. People's lives are being transformed by God's love. Your homework this week is to find at least one person who could use a little more of that love and invite them to come with you next week. Trust me, it's worth the extra effort. Mrs. Edwards, you want to listen to some music on the way? Go ahead, your choice. <sighs> okay, here we are. love that. I love that interaction. We're going to keep playing that until you guys invite people to church, even if it's just online. Uh, and so I'll say again, share the link. Go ahead for those who have just signed on. Um, share the link. Share on your Facebook or share on your YouTube. Text it out that you're here. We want also want to engage with you while you are watching the service. And so we ask you to go ahead and leave comments, leave thumbs up emojis. We are we are watching the the stream as as you guys are leaving comments, and so we want to engage with you. So go ahead and put down, you know, give it amen, a thumbs up, or what was said, or what was that point again. We have uh, we want to have some engagement there. So make sure you do that. Share this before I get into the sermon. There were a lot of birthdays that happened this past week or so. So my son Jonathan turned 15 uh, last week. You had Jason Craig, his birthday was a couple days ago. My mom's birthday. Happy birthday, mom. Her birthday was this past Friday. Uh, we have uh, some others. I, I feel like I'm missing some people, but we had a lot of birthdays. Janelle's birthday, that's what it was. I can't forget Janelle. Sorry, Janelle. Janelle's birthday as well. Um, and then Jairus' youngest son, Kingsley's birthday. A lot of birthdays in this week of October. So happy birthday to all those who've had a birthday in the last week or so, and then those who are coming. Don't, don't get mad at me because I forgot. Happy birthday to all October babies. Uh, and so we are in the middle of a series. Last week we were we met in person, which was great for those who were able to attend at Benjamin Attachment Middle School. Uh, right now we're not able to meet on a regular basis there, and so that was a kind of a one-off for October. But we were excited to give a message as we look back to what God was doing and what He was doing for us in the future. So more information has come out about that. If you missed that sermon, you can go check it out on our YouTube page. Uh, but God has great things in store for us coming up as we look to how we can meet in person throughout COVID and, and into the future. Uh, and so, but we're back into the normal, regular, regular programming of the story of Moses as we look at faith over fear and knowing that God does not want us to live in fear. He wants us to move in faith. And that's the question we pose to you is which one are you going to choose? Do you choose faith or you choose fear? And if you've been reading the book of Exodus, and we encourage you to do it for the month of October. As you look at Moses' life, you can see the times where he responds in faith and how God moves. 
and how he just shows up in a mighty way. But when Moses moves in fear, how that has a negative uh, re repercussion for Moses' life and how that has the same thing in our own lives when we operate out of fear. But God did not give us a spirit of fear. He gives us a spirit of sound mind and, and of power and knowing that he is for us, that no one can be against us, so we move in that. So we are marching right through Exodus. We are not even halfway yet, but the story picks up pretty quick after this. We just went through the plagues. Uh, Jason did all nine plagues two weeks ago. Last week, we kind of did an offshoot talking about uh, what's you know, celebrating us coming back together the first time in seven months. But now we're back into the story. and We're picking up in this in Exodus, the book of Exodus, which is the second book in the Bible. Uh, and we're in chapter, uh, uh, chapter 11. And we're talking about the last plague. And the last plague is significant. It was significant enough that we wanted to do a sermon just on this 10th plague. And so it's the 10th plague has its own chapter. All the other plagues have to share chapter 7 through 9 and then, or uh, 7 through 10. And the, the 10th plague has its own chapter. You can find that in Exodus chapter 11. And we're going to read through it. We're just going to pick up right in the middle of it. If you miss any of them, go back to our YouTube channel and you can see all the sermons you missed. But go ahead and turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 11 and your, or your device is also going to be on the screen. And I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's 10 verses. And this is what it says. This is God and Moses having a conversation. Then Moses goes and speaks to Pharaoh what God told him. It says this in Exodus 11, starting in verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. And after that, he will let go, let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. Tell the people that men and women alike are to ask their neighbors for articles of silver and gold. We're going to skip verse 3. We're going to go to verse 4. So Moses said, this is what the Lord says. And now he's talking to Pharaoh, Moses to Pharaoh. At about midnight, I will go throughout Egypt, and the firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, to the firstborn son of the female slave, who is at, the, at her handmill, and all the firstborn of cattle as well. There will be a loud wailing throughout Egypt. Worse than ever has ever been, been and ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any person or animal. Then you will know the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And all the officials of, of yours will come to me, bowing down before me and saying, Go, you and all the people who follow you. And after that, I will leave. Then Moses, with hot anger, I love that it says that, left Pharaoh. Verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you so that my wonders may be multiplied in Egypt. Verse 10, Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let the Israelites go out of his country. This last statement is sort of a summary of Pharaoh's heart in general, but we'll see the difference reaction between this plague when it actually happens compared to the last nine, nine plagues. See, the Israelites are told that if they were to sacrifice a lamb and put, put the blood on the doorposts and the, across the doorframe of their, their house, that the Lord will pass over them and this plague of the first form will not happen. To illustrate that, we know we've been doing flannel graph. We're going to take this to the flannel graph board and just give a little synopsis of what just went, what went down. And so let's go, to, let's go to the board. So we have Pharaoh here. He's still here in his chair. Uh, he should be standing up now, but we haven't cut him out. So Pharaoh and Moses are having this conversation where Moses is telling Pharaoh, hey, look, we've had these nine plagues, and you haven't let the people go. And so God has told me this is the last plague. This is what's going to happen, that the firstborn of everyone in Egypt is going to die, the firstborn male, from you to the poorest person and to all the cattle. It's going to happen. This is God's last judgment upon you, Pharaoh. And Pharaoh still does not believe. And since Pharaoh has hardened, already hardened his heart, God hardened his heart more. So he cannot let his people go. He would not let the Israelites go in this. And because of this, God tells Moses, this is going to chapter, uh, chapter 12 and 13, but God tells Moses, Moses, 
Because of this, what you're going to do, so, the, so death does not come to the doorpost, the doorframe of the Israelites, you are to take a blood of a lamb and you are to spread it over the up frame, the vertical frame of the door frame, and across the door frame. So when death, the death angel comes over to your house, it will pass over because the blood of the lamb shows that you are one of God's people. And this is called the Passover. We sell the, the, the Jewish custom, the Jewish faith still celebrates this today. And we're going to explain how that signifies to us, what significance that's to us. But in this, we want to talk about the firstborn. This is very significant, what's happening here in, in this last plague, the death of the firstborn. And what is so, why is that so important? And why is this like so heavy? As I've been talking about this, I've talked to it with the youth group kids about two weeks ago, I've been talking about this last plague with my, with my wife and my son, and the same thing, the same questions come about. Why would God do this? Like, why would he, why would he allow this to happen? That God would say that in Exodus 12, verse 29 and 33, says that midnight the Lord struck down the firstborn in Egypt and the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne and the firstborn of prisoners who were in the dungeon and the firstborn of, of the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was a loud wailing, wailing in Egypt for there was not a house without someone dead. Verse 31, and during the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up, leave my people, you and your Israelites, go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said and go. But check this out. The last thing it says, and also bless me, like, like the nerve of Pharaoh, the nerve of Pharaoh. Uh, but he saw that God was the real God. And he says, I need a blessing from, from, from the, the real God. And verse 33 says, the Egyptians urged the people to hurry to leave the country. Otherwise, they said, we will also die. Understand this. In this firstborn dying, there's the righteous judgment of God. See, often we like to think of God as loving, merciful God, like almost buddy Jesus God, like that God that always has my back, the God of Jeremiah 29, 11, that he has a plan for me, a plan to succeed, a plan for me not to fail. Like we have this this image in our head of God that he's always loving and always going to take care of, but we forget the God that is righteous and we forget about the God that is just and we forget about the God who is a God of wrath and forget about the God who's a jealous God and God will have no other God before him. He will have nothing before him and because of our sin, death is due to us. Judgment is due to us. We don't like to think of God that way. But that is the character of God from the beginning, from Adam to Eve, all the way to the end of Revelation, that God is a God of justice, and he has to act justly. And so here, this last plague, is God is in the right in doing this. But the question is, Dion, like, help me understand this. Like, how could a good God possibly be a part of striking down all the firstborn sons of Egypt? Like, especially some of those children who personally are not at fault. Like, couldn't God have just killed Pharaoh? Like, why does God have to even touch babies? Why do he have to touch children? Well, let's talk about this. I, that is a very good question, and that, that makes you wrestle with God. It makes you wrestle with, like, I thought God was a loving God. What's up with that? Why is he killing the firstborn male? Like, what's, what's up? So let's, let's, let's talk about it. There's several things that we need to keep in mind, and when I say keep in mind, I'm putting that in quotations. We need to keep this in mind when we're looking at this last plague and God bringing death to the firstborn males of the house of Egypt. And keeping in mind, we have to understand that when we read the Bible, especially us here in America, we read it in a Western world, a Western culture, and that children are innocent. But the Bible does not say that. Children are not innocent. None of us are innocent. It says in Romans 3 that none of us are righteous. Not one. And if you understand that, if you're a parent, you've seen the littlest kids. I just will, went to my, my little nephew's two-year-old birthday, and my little man, it was great. He was having cake, and he was happy. But at the same time, I saw him take a swing at someone. Like, I saw him take, like, I will knock you out. And, like, no one taught him that. I know his parents are not teaching him to fight and to, you know, may have his will, oppose his will. But he's not righteous. He's not innocent. 
And you know that as well, if you have children or if you're a child yourself, you know, even at the age of four or five or one or two, like none of us are innocent. We are selfish, sinful beings. And so in fact, that tells us that we're born into sin. We must keep that in mind that God can see what a child will end up to become. God knows what kind of man I would be. God knows what kind of person a child is going to be. Most likely, this is a merciful act for God for these children, these Egyptian children. And we're not even sure that all the people, all the people, the firstborns were children. We think that in our heads, but a lot of them could have been adults or or like full grown men who are still living at home. And so they're the first ones to die because there's no other, they're the firstborn male and they didn't have a child. Like we think about little children, but they're expounding that firstborn is not just kids. It's the firstborn male of that household. But the Bible doesn't actually say it's children. It doesn't say it's men. It just says the firstborn. But in our heads, we think children and we're thinking, why is God killing innocent children? But God, they're not, they're not necessarily innocent. But before you get mad at me and be like, Dion, you're making me mad, the Bible does teach that little children, young children, do go to heaven. Like God does not hold that, that, that against them. The, the moment or the recognize, them being able to recognize who God is and who they are in the sinful nature, that is when they come to an age of knowing who, who God is and be able to, to, if they take their last breath here prematurely, we don't see any kid perish, that they would be with God. So the Bible does teach that, but at the same time, they are sinful. They are like, none of them are righteous. But the most of these kids, understand this, that most of these kids, these Egyptian kids, they would have been allowed to grow up. If they've been allowed to grow up, they were grown up in the Egyptian way, which means they've been grown up worshiping other false gods. They have grown up in wickedness, which would have caused them to actually be on the way to hell and not when they took the last breath here, to be with God in heaven. And so even in that, there's a mercy that God is doing by taking the children back to him. If we think of them all as children, he's taking them back amongst to himself, saving them from a path that's going to lead them away to false gods. Our Western world, we don't think that. We we think of their innocence and children are innocent. But in the Bible, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And this God's grace and his mercy that he allows children, he brings children to him when they do take their last breath here if they're still children. But let us not forget that none of us are righteous, even as children. We must keep that in mind. We also must keep in mind that God is patient in being in his judgment. See, the Israelites were not just enslaved for 10 years. They weren't just enslaved for 15 years. They had been in Egypt and possibly enslaved for hundreds of years. They were in Egypt for a total of 400 years, and a good majority of those years, they were enslaved by the Egyptians. And God waits, and he waits, and he waits to bring judgment upon them. See, he gives the Egyptians a chance to repent of their ways. And God did not just send one plague, he sent 10 plagues. He gave them 10 chances to repent. So keep in mind, not only that none of us are innocent, keep in mind that, that God is a God who waits, who waited and waited and waited. But keep in mind that God does not take pleasure in giving punishment. God does not take pleasure in being this just God. So it says that he laments a lot of times in the Old Testament of him being not wanting to do what he know he must do because he's a just God. In the New Testament, it's not going to be on the screen, but in 2 Peter, the New Testament, it says, God doesn't wish anyone to perish. He loves his creation. He wants his creation to come and be with him. But there comes a time where God must be just because that is just who he is. He is just, and it is a just punishment for our sins. See, when we look at the God and his framework with Moses, we have to look back what, what what happened transpired way back in the beginning of Exodus. In Exodus 4, 22 to 23, God is talking to Pharaoh. Before he goes to Pharaoh, he tells Moses that you're going to tell Pharaoh this, that God says, Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me. What are you talking about? God is telling 
Moses to tell Pharaoh, you need to let my firstborn son go. What firstborn son here he's talking about is Israel. You need to let my people go, my firstborn go, so they may worship me, but you refuse to let them go. So I will kill your firstborn son. Moses says that to Pharaoh way back in the beginning, before all the plagues and everything happened. And Moses like, Pharaoh was like, what? What are you talking about? Kill my son. Like Pharaoh's hot, heated, upset that Moses would say that to him. And Moses wasn't happy to say that, that God would have him say that to Pharaoh. So this is not something that is like coming out of the blue. God, God warned Pharaoh way back before all of this started. See, the Israelites are God's firstborn, and, and what we have is the Egyptians. What are they doing to God's firstborn? What has the Egyptians done to God's firstborn? They have enslaved them. Imagine that, God's firstborn being enslaved. And if you remember back the first chapter in, in, in Exodus, where Pharaoh starts to get worried about the Israelites, and it's not necessarily this Pharaoh, but a, a Pharaoh is worried about the Israelites, so he puts out a decree. He says this in Exodus 1.22. Then Pharaoh gave an order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born must be thrown into the Nile, but let the girls live. And the Egyptians are going to most likely continue this, this genocide of the Hebrew slaves periodically. So you can't just have this to be a one-moment thing because you just kill the the, two, the babies one time, the population is still going to grow. They're going to grow in number. But then you can't just keep doing this process because if you do that, then you won't have enough slaves. You need, you need male boys to become male men so they can, male men, they can become full-grown men so they can have children so they, they continue the population of the slaves. So this was a process that kept happening over a period of time. When the numbers would go up, they would kill more little boys. And then they will, when they let the numbers swing low, and then when the numbers go up, they'll just do this periodically. They would just get rid of, they would kill newborn baby boys. We can't forget that. And in this process, we look at that, like that should break your heart. It breaks my heart to think about all the aborting that was happening, all the murder that was happening to, to all these little baby boys. But God did not forget but you can't stop, just can't stop doing this. It says this, uh, we're told in chapter 12, that this wailing that's happening, this outcry of the Egyptians after the plague of their firstborn, when the plague actually happens, this last plague, there's this wailing that happens that I read. The same exact wording in Hebrew is used to describe when the Israelites were crying out to God when they're killing their baby boys. The same wailing that that the Egyptians were having because the firstborn of their household had died is the same wailing that was happening when they were killing the Hebrew baby boys. Notice that I said in chapter 1 that Pharaoh, he's not the one killing the baby boys. Who are? It's the people. The people are the ones who are living out the words, who are executing the words of Pharaoh. They're following the orders that Pharaoh gave, and over and over and over again, they're putting to death the Israelites, these little boys. In fact, some scholars say the amount of the firstborn Egyptian sons killed by the plague is not it's a significantly less than the amount of lives that were lost by this practice of getting rid of baby boys when they're born. Outweighs it. There were so many lives lost, so many infants lost through the, to the Israelites, to the Hebrews, in comparison to this 10th plague when it takes place. This plague was not just on the firstborn. This plague, I'm sorry, this plague was just on the firstborn. It wasn't to every male as the Egyptians did to the Hebrews. This plague was a one-time event. But to the Hebrews, this was something that happened periodically over a set many of years where they would go and take these baby boys and terminate them. See, we need to understand this. And God is at war with Egypt. We don't see it this way, but these plagues are like God's rockets and God's bombs and God's like, he's at war 
with the false gods of Egypt and and the Egyptian people and Pharaoh for what they're doing to us. He, they're at, he's at war. He's trying to set the captives free. There's war happening. We need to see it and understand it on the spiritual warfare that's happening that plays out in the physical world as well. God is at war. So when war happens, these kind of things, and this is not how God wants it to be, but God is a just God. He's a jealous God. And so he will fight our battles. He will fight. He's been fighting for Israel, and he fights for you the same way. God, it says in Romans 12, it's not on your screen, but in Romans 12, it says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. That is what God does. So he's at war with the Egyptians. And he is saying, I'm using my last weapon that's going to end this war. And it infected, infected all of the Egyptians. And whether the people were murdered or these people, whether the Egyptians were, there, were the, that first hand murdering of, of these baby boys or they were not, they were also were absolutely compliant and compl- complicit into what was happening to the Egyptians, what was happening, sorry, what happened into the Israelites. They, could, they, they were not just innocent bystanders because generation after generation after generation were oppressing and enslaving and in this practicing of killing Hebrew slaves. They were culpable in this injustice for hundreds and hundreds of years. In church, if you're hearing this and I'm speaking to you and this is causing you to have some fear and I want to say, no, no, you need to move in faith. You need to move in faith that this is a call to repentance because you could say, I have been doing the same thing. I have been putting to death the church. I have been standing against God. I have been doing wrong. I have been sinning for so long and now I have this fear. And God says, I don't want you to be motivated by fear. I do want you to fear me and understand the, the power of who I am, but I want you to move in faith that I am here for you, here to protect you, here to love you, here to rescue you. As we get to see in the rest of this plague, as we plays out and what it means for the Hebrews. But church, hear me. The person watching this, hear me. There's no better time than now to repent. To say, I, God, I know I've wronged. God, I know I've done way opposite of what you've called me to do and how to love and how to live. And God, I give that to you and I want to live for you. But the Egyptians never did that. And so we had a righteous judgment. Not just that we had a righteous judgment, but we had the redemption of the firstborn. So we need to understand that as well. We have this redemption of the firstborn. And we'll see that this judgment will not fall on the firstborn sons of Israel because they are spared by the blood of the lamb. So like I showed on the flannel graph, Moses is told, and then if you read in, in Exodus 12 and 13, we're not going to read all, all that, but if you read into Exodus 12 and 13, we're going to read a passage of it, that Moses instructed how to have death pass over them, how to have death not come to their door. See, as a result, the Israelites are told from here and now, they're supposed to give back to their firstborn, back to God because of what God did, Why? because God saved their firstborn. It says this in Exodus 13, 11 through 13, it says this, after the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you, as he promised an oath to you and your ancestors, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belongs to the Lord redeem with the lamb of the firstborn donkey. And if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. All right, you guys got it? You're like, um, pastor, what are you talking about? Like, oh, I, don't, I don't understand. We break a neck here and I don't have a donkey and I don't have a lamb and I'm supposed to give my firstborn son? Like, I don't, I understand. I understand if you're getting ready with your morning coffee and you're opening up like I do and go out in my back porch and I open it and you're reading Exodus 13 and you start reading you're like, um, how's that apply to me today? Uh, so let me explain. Let me give you some, like, if you're not into reading the history or knowing what's going on, this will just like whoosh, go over your head. So let's break it down. All right. The firstborn is very, very significant. Why God chose firstborn in this. So understand, hear me. All right, first of all, it's significant that God chooses firstborn. The firstborn is the way of acknowledging that every life comes from the beginning is from God. 
the firstborn signify, acknowledge that every beginning, every life that is started on this earth comes from God. That is what the firstborn signifies. How does it signify that? Well, here's our parallel example. The Israelites were supposed to give the first fruit of the harvest to God. They're supposed to say, it is God who gave me this fruit. And so to acknowledge that it was God that gave me this fruit uh, or this harvest, I'm going to give my first to God to say, God, look what you gave me. What Here, I give this to you. That is what the Old Testament says. Christians in the New Testament, we're told to do the same thing and set aside the first fruit of our pay, the first fruit of your paycheck, the first fruit of your wages to say, God, you have blessed me with this. I'm going to give the first of this to you for you to use it for the kingdom. How do you want me to use this? How do you want to give it to the church or the storehouse? That's what we're called to do as Christians. Why? Because when you do that, it's very clearly acknowledging that this belongs to God, that this is what God has given to me. And I want to show that I acknowledge that all good things come from God. I'm going to say it again. Every good thing is from God. And so we acknowledge that with our first. When there is, when you're having a birthday, I just had a birthday, my little nephew Kingsley, his, his birthday, we acknowledge that this is a good day for Kingsley. And so he gets the first piece of cake. Now, we're not worshiping him, but we're honoring that this is a good day. We're remembering this day. And so you get the first. We acknowledge and we do that with mealtimes. We acknowledge we want to honor women and children, so we allow, we're supposed to, allow women and children to eat first. Or if you want to acknowledge the dad, the dad is in your household, if it's like dad is the one who's going out and killing the pig and making the bacon, however, whatever the saying is, and you give the food to the dad, like you're honoring and you're giving the first to, God is saying that with us. We are to give our first acknowledging and honoring him. It's not just an Old Testament thing, it's, it's New Testament as well. So if you give the first back to God, you're also trusting that God will provide the rest. Oh, hear me when I say that, I'm going to say it again. If you give the first back to God, you're saying that I trust God is going to do enough, or even more than enough, for what is left, what the rest that I have. So the Israelites are supposed to give their firstborn of their flocks and the firstborn of their son, okay? That's what they're supposed to do. This is what it tells them to do. So the firstborn flock, we kind of understand. The firstborn was to be sacrificed in the celebratory meal, and in this belief in doing that, you're saying that God will provide all our needs, and everything that we have comes from him. So first, your goat had a, had a, had a kid, then you take that first kid, and you would eat it and consume it, it'll be a feast. If you had a cow, the first calf that 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 that, that heifer and I, that, you know the female cow that she has, you take that and you would eat it and celebrate celebratory and remember what God's done, and you would do that for every firstborn, and you would just keep track like not the firstborn of every year, but the very first one taken. The rest of them will belong to you. All the other offspring will belong to you. So we understand that, but let's talk about this firstborn son. Your firstborn son which signifies the family is going to be able to continue on their family line, which is very significant and very important in the Jewish faith, and a lot of families it still is. You're not going to sacrifice your son like you're a bunch of pagans. You're not going to say, okay, you're not going to do, like, put them on an altar and, and kill your son. Like, that's not what God is saying. It's supposed to be an offering of some symb- symbolic offering, and this is how it play out. So today we do, modern day today, we do baby dedication. And in a baby dedication, what we do... We symbolically say, God, you've given us this child. We give this child to you. God, we ask you to bless this child. We give him into your hands. We give her into your hands. And we say, it, this child is yours. And at the same time, you don't leave the child there. You don't leave the child to church. You don't leave him at wherever the dedication is happening. You take the child back. You say, okay, now we're going to raise this child as if God has called us, as God has called us to raise this son or daughter of ours. But in Exodus 13, it says that we are to redeem their sons back, okay? So what does that mean? We've done the dedication, we, we, we've done the symbolic offering, but it says that we're to redeem them back. How are you supposed to do that? Well, if you were Jewish and Hebrew, you would go to Numbers 18, and Numbers 18 is not going to be on the screen, 
tells you that you are to redeem your first son born back with five shekels. You're like, what is five shekels? It's five coins. Like, that doesn't really matter, but five shekels. So you would go to the priest, you would give five shekels as you have given your first son over to God and it's a symbolic offering, and then you will redeem them back five shekels, and that will show that you are redeeming them back and you'll be doing what God said in Exodus 13. So you get it all, like, so you understand what that all means. This context is instructions right in the middle of this 10th plague. In Exodus 13, this plague that's being played out, God gives these instructions to Moses to tell to all the houses of Israel, to all the Hebrew slaves, that this is what's supposed to happen. And we talk, there's a Passover meal that's supposed to happen. There's this, this firstborn of all the, from all the wombs and the firstborn son. You are to give to God, and then you are to redeem him back. This all happens right in the middle of God having this war against the Egyptians with the plague in the first household, first male in every household. See, when you are dedicate your firstborn to God and redeem him back, you're always reminded of the mighty acts of God out of Egypt. And God says that this indeed is the purpose why he wanted people to dedicate their firstborn and to buy them back. And this has significance upon our lives as Christians. And we get to share that right towards the end of the sermon. So remember this redeeming back your firstborn, this five shekels that you're supposed to redeem back. Or in this context, you're supposed to redeem back with another, another sacrifice. But it says this in Exodus 13, 14 through 16, in the New Living Translation, it says, And in the future, your children will ask, what does this all mean? Then you will tell them, with the power of God and his mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, so the Lord killed all the firstborn males throughout the land of Egypt, both people and animals. And that is why I now sacrifice all the firstborn males to the Lord, except that the firstborn males will always be brought back. And this ceremony will be like a mark branded on your hands and on your forehead. And it will be a reminder of the power of the Lord's mighty hand that brought us out of Egypt. Church, can you hear that this is always pointing back to Jesus. I'm so excited to get to this part of Jesus. We're going to get there. But in, the, in, in those days, when you dedicated and redeemed your first son, you were literally thinking about the exodus that God provided for Egypt, for Israel out of Egypt. It was the way the people to remember that even through their firstborn sons, even though their firstborn sons were sinful, God saved them. That they probably should have died like the other firstborn sons. But God, in his grace and his mercy, sent a rescue plan and a plan to buy them back, to bring them back, to redeem them back through the sacrifice of a lamb that you would kill that was blameless, that this lamb had no blemish, and that you would take its blood and you would put it on the doorpost, on the vertical side and on the cross member side. And so when death came to this house, the firstborn would have been saved because of the blood of the lamb that took upon the sins of that household. I had this great conversation with the youth group when I posed this question. Here's the question. Jason preached two weeks ago in saying that the plagues that came to, to, to this land of Egypt and, and to the Israelites, that the Israelites were spared from so many of these, that God protected them from so many of these plagues. So my question to the youth group was like, but why is God not necessarily, you know, saving them from this. Why is death also going to be over Egypt, also come over to Goshen, where the Israelites is? Why? And I was so proud that the first person who said, was like, I know why, because we all deserve death. And it's like, you, yes, our sin requires that we deserve death. It's not going to be on your screen, but it says in Romans that for the wages of sin is death. That is the wage of sin. Because we have wronged, we deserve death. Israelites, even though they were enslaved by the Egyptians, they had sinned against God many times before. And so their penalty was death. But because of the blood, God says, I'll recognize the sacrifice of a perfect lamb that their blood will save you from the death of the firstborn. 
the significance of that to the Israelites and what its significance to us as Christians is so powerful, church, that it should cause you to move out of a place of fear and saying, I believe God has a rescue plan for me and that his rescue plan will save me from myself, will save me from my sin. God, I want to follow you in your ways because I am now adopted into this firstborn, which is called the family of God. See, everything we have is from God and everything we have is saved by God. God did all the rescuing. We couldn't rescue ourselves. The Israelites couldn't rescue themselves. God says, I'll rescue you. I'll take you out. I won't even just rescue you to get you out of slavery. I will rescue you from death itself. See, the firstborn of all creation sets us free from captivity. Come on, somebody. I hope you write that down. When I wrote, when that came to my mind and heart and spirit, I was like, that is, oh, the firstborn of all creation sets us free from all captivity. This is what's quite interesting. This is, but it gets even more interesting as we, as I've been pre- preluding all the way to that the New Testament is bringing the Old Testament together and has been brought together by Jesus. That this is describing Jesus. Jesus is called God's only son. Thus, he is his firstborn. Jesus is Mary's firstborn. In the New Testament, even multiple times, overtly and purposely calls Jesus the firstborn. Colossians 1.15 says this, the son is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn over all of creation. And it's not that Jesus was this one time created or born. It's like, no, that's not it. It is that Jesus has the power and the rights of the firstborn. And the firstborn is very significant which is a big deal in ancient history. See, the firstborn has all the power of the family. The firstborn has all the power and the inheritance. And the firstborn gets much of the blessing. And Jesus was also the firstborn among the dead, that it says in Colossians 1.18. In the Old Testament, God's people remembered their exodus through the celebrating of the Passover meal that was redeemed, that redeemed their firstborn. Oh, church, the significance of the Passover redeemed their firstborn. And that is why God told them that you are to redeem back your firstborn because the blood of the lamb redeemed your firstborn in your household. And that the blood of the lamb, Jesus, redeems the firstborn of God, which God calls Israel his firstborn back in the beginning of Exodus. In church, we... I've been adopted into this family, which we are able to call ourselves the firstborn. We are due death like the firstborns of the household of Egyptians. But because of the blood of Jesus that came down the vertical posts and went across the vertical, the, the horizontal posts, covers us. So when death approaches us, it passes over us. And it makes us significant that we are adopted now into the family of God as part of his firstborn. So we see when the firstborn son of God, not an act of punishment of sin on us or on others, but Jesus takes the plague of the firstborn upon himself. I love it when John says in John chapter 1, and it's not going to be where John says, the next day when John, you know, John was questioned by the Pharisees and Sadducees and they're asking him, why are you baptizing him if you're not the, the, uh, you're not the Messiah, Elijah, or the prophet? And he says, there's one coming that you do not none know who stands among you, whose shoes I'm unworthy untie. And then the next day, John says, he sees Jesus approaching him. And he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world that is Jesus and that's what he's done for me. That's what he's done for you. That's what he's done for the whole world. We understand that in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only firstborn son that whoever believes in him will not perish, will not die, will not get the death of the firstborn of the Egyptians, but have everlasting life. Oh, church, do you see the parallel? Do you see why this tenth flood is so significant? Because one, it should recognize that we all deserve death. 
But because of the blood of the lamb, death does not come to us. Again, it's not going to be on screen, but Isaiah 53 says, says the, the pain, the, surely he had pain. Surely pain was upon him. And we consider him stricken by God, afflicted by him. And that the punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. But we like sheep have gone astray. Each have gone to our own way. And the iniquities that was, our iniquities were laid upon Jesus, laid upon him. Jesus is the lamb for us, the final sacrifice, the final redempting to bring the firstborn back to himself, to bring the firstborn back to God. It says this in Exodus 13, 14. It says that in these days, your sons will ask you, what does this mean? And we will say the mighty hand of God brought us out of Egypt and out of slavery. Remember, as harsh as it sounds, that it was death of the firstborn sons that ultimately set the people free. I'm going to say it again. It was the death of the firstborn sons of Egypt that ultimately set them free. Because Pharaoh finally says, you're free. Leave. In church, the significance of that. God wants us to remember the very fact. So God put it in a system of rituals that would make them make sure that they would not forget. Why? For one reason is that he, he wanted them to understand when Jesus came as the firstborn son, gave his life on a cross, that the light bulb should have went off in their heads and in their minds, and they should have been able to connect the dots. For the Jews would have most certainly have recognized that Jesus was the firstborn son. And just like the firstborn of sons of the Egyptians were killed, thus setting them free from slavery, that the firstborn son of all creation was killed so they could be set free from the slavery of sin. John was giving this message. Jesus was giving this message. And as I said, as I said, read, read earlier in Exodus 13, that Jesus said, that God said that this would be like branding your foreheads and your hands so you do not forget. And what did Jesus do when he came on the cross? He was branded with the marks of the sacrifice on his hands, on purpose, because this goes back to the Passover. And Jesus, as that lamb was consumed and that lamb was broken for the Egypt, for the Hebrews, so the death will pass. Jesus says, I am that lamb. Can you not see? I have been sacrificed for you, that the firstborn of creation was sacrificed for you so that you are no longer a slave to sin. Paul tells this to the Christians in the Romans church in Romans 6, 18. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Jesus sets you free from sin. And now you're saying, I will be Lord to you. I will be servant to you in all righteousness. The New Testament is constantly using language of slavery because it is echoing the story of the firstborn son dying to set us free as we march into the promised land of heaven. And church, that exactly is what is happening in this story for the Hebrews and Moses, that they are marching into the promised land God has for them because of the firstborn plague. My question to you is, how does this information change your life? How does this information view this story different? How does this understanding of the firstborn death of the Egyptians and the firstborn giving to God and but redeeming back and then the firstborn of all creation dying for you, that should make a significant impact on your life. And my prayer is that it does. My prayer is that you understand that I am just like the Egyptians. I have pushed God away, 
over and over. I've seen signs. I've heard songs. I've heard people pray for me. I've heard God call my name. I've heard the name of Jesus Christ. I've heard that I should go to church. I've heard, I've heard all these things. And there comes a time where guys can say, I have, death is at your doorstep. But Jesus will take death that is due to you and he will place it upon himself. And if you take this, take this bread, take this body, take Christ, what he's done for you, and you say, I consume it, I want it, I make Jesus the Lord of my life, death passes over you. But death cannot hold Jesus down. He is not in a grave. He is alive at the right hand of the Father, interceding on your behalf as you are being adopted into this family. Church, these 10 plagues, yes, they happen in Egypt. But there's something that's speaking to you. to say, I've had plagues happening in my life. I have, knowing that I'm due sin, I'm due death. Who can save me? God has sent a rescue plan to a man named Jesus Christ. Believe it or not, he died for you. And if you accept him as your Lord and Savior, you will move from death to life. And not just to live, but to have life abundantly and to spend eternity with God. When you take your last breath here on earth, you will be in presence with God. Not because you deserve it, because of love. And if that is something that you've never heard and never understood and you really want to embrace that and have that, we encourage you to pray a prayer. And the prayer is not magical. There's no magic words. But this prayer is between you and God in your heart and understanding. So let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you we're able to look back and have, in the exodus of the Egyptians, of the, of the Israelites out of Egypt, and how that same process and system of a sacrificial lamb, the bloodshed that protected the firstborn of the Israelites applies to us as well because of Jesus. And if this is something that you say, I need for myself, I need this rescue plan to be applied to my life, you pray this prayer, God, I accept that you are God. And I accept that I am a sinner. But God, I believe that Jesus died for me, and I believe that I need a rescue from myself. Lord, I confess that Jesus is Lord. Lord, I confess that I have fallen short. I have sinned against you. I have sinned against my brothers and sisters and people. And I have sinned against myself. God, I, I ask him for you to deliver me from my sin. And Lord, I will spend eternity with you. God, I place my faith in you. And I make you Lord of my life. I am no longer my own, but I belong to you. Holy Spirit, come, lead and guide me. That's all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, or you re-prayed that prayer, and this time is, this is it, like you, you sense it, you feel it, please let us know. Please say something in the comments. Please reach out to me personally on Facebook, or Instagram, TikTok, email, text message. Let us know. He's saying, I've, I've, I've given my life to God or I've recommitted. This 10th plague hit home with me. If you're someone who's like, I've been a Christian, but I understand, like I get a deeper understanding, like I need to give God my first. I need to understand this redeeming process. I need to understand this. I would love to have more conversation. Jason would love to have conversation with you. But church, this is your time to understand that God loves you. He has a plan for you. So we're going to move into the time where we're going to sing this song, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to have some announcements. But use this time of reflection as we sing this song how God loves us. Let this minister to you in Jesus' name.
faith holds me now. Here I stand. God, thank you. Thank you so much for your, for your word and for being a worship. Thank you, Turpins, again, for providing worship for us. As we close this time together, we also, also want to give you an opportunity to give as an extension of your worship, uh, tithes and offerings as God has led you to give. And so if you call Bowie City Church your church home, uh, we give you three ways to give as we're meeting online. You can give at BowieCityChurch.com. You can go to give, which is going to be in your top right corner. <clears throat> Hit the give button, and then you'll be able to just follow simple instructions to be able to give there online. You also can download an app called Tithely, T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y, and then look up Bowie City Church. We're the only one there. Go there, and you can give there, and you can set up giving uh, to missions as we have plenty of missions opportunities or choose how you want to give. You can have a, a recurring every other week, once a month, however you want to set up. Uh, or you can mail in a check, and that uh, address is at the bottom of the webpage if you want to mail in a check as well. So this is an extension of your worship. You don't give to a church, you give through the church, and know that missions is happening from local, from the Bowie Food Pantry, to parts of the world that we are not able to physically go, but we're ministering and uh, helping people get there to present the gospel and to have the kingdom of God go forward. So this is uh, your opportunity to do that. As we close, I have uh, also an announcement for us as a church uh, we are going to continue to have online presence. We have uh, invested in equipment, invested uh, in time and effort to understand how we can do that uh, going forward. So this is an option, not just because we're in COVID, but going forward here on out that we will have an online presence via our website or social media or YouTube or Facebook. But for us to have live services, we are going to be able to do that by being a partner with another church um, which is awesome. So First Christian Church has opened their church home to us, which is literally 11 uh, miles or so here from Bowie. Uh, and so it is down set, or going towards Upper Marlboro, towards Largo, really down at the end of uh, 193 and Route 202. It's not too far away. Uh, but if you want to engage in live worship, live sermon, with, with social distancing, with a mask, and you know, sitting six feet apart and things of that sort, and you're comfortable with that, we will be having our services, combined service, with First Christian Church, as they're a small church too, as we are going to be linking arms through this pandemic and helping them meet a need, and, and they're helping us meet a need as well. So we're excited about this partnership. We don't know where God has us to go long-term or not. If it could be a couple months, it could be years, it could be a full-blown merger. We don't know, but what we do know is guys at work right now. And so we are, we'll have the address to the church. We'll be posting up official uh, announcement that we had on, on Facebook and an email, also text reminders. We will continue to be here, uh, Facebook Live and, or, and streaming and also on YouTube. So you don't have to miss that if you don't want to travel to First Christian uh, for whatever reason, you can be online. But we encourage you, if you feel comfortable and okay and doing social distancing, you want to have that option, that is now available. So I'm excited for you. I thank the elder team down there and their congregation for opening their home, uh, church home and building to us as we worship together. The church time might change. It might change to 1015, just 15 minutes earlier than normal instead of 1030, move to 1015. Uh, but all that official stuff will come out this week. We're excited for it. Uh, I'm pumped up to be, be able to give live worship and live preaching and fellowship together as we walk through this pandemic arm in arm uh, with another congregation who finds themselves kind of in the same boat uh, where they're struggling because of this pandemic and COVID has done to their congregation and their needs. So First Christian Church at Brock Halls, where we will be having our live services um, from here at least through the uh, through the new year, and we'll reevaluate that uh, as we get closer. But at least for the next 10 weeks or so, that's where we'll be having our live service. So I'm excited. Hopefully you can come make it. If not, still be online, still engage with the comments. Uh, we still have city groups that are happening on Wednesday nights with the, the women at Elizabeth, Elizabeth and Milford Craig's home in the peace section of Bowie. We have men's study. We have one more here at my house, and we might be moving locations because we meet outside on that porch and it's getting a little frosty outside. So uh, we might be moving indoors to a new location, but at least for next Saturday at my home, uh, which will, which is here, and at eight o'clock in the morning on Saturdays in the youth group, we have a virtual um, Zoom link if you need that. If you are a teenager, we can send that out to you as well. But you guys be blessed. If you need anything from the church, let us know. Excited what God is doing with this partnership at First Christian Church. And we hope to see you 
there or online or in one of the city groups. You guys be, be blessed and be in prayer for our political process. Lift our government in prayer uh, as well. And um, God is in the midst, so we trust in him. You be blessed, and we'll see you next week.